Hi, Dennis Holy here. Uh, if you're a regular viewer of This Is America and the World, you know that for the past 10 years, we've been focused internationally, traveling to uh, foreign countries, learning about other countries, other cultures. Well, uh, a pandemic arrived, COVID, a virus, uh, back in March or February or even January and no international travel for us, so uh, we're gonna shift gears. We're in the middle of a horrific pandemic, health crisis, physical and mental, uh, financial crisis, uh, lost jobs, unemployment, uh, a new civil rights era, uh, and we're all going through some really tough times, hard times, this is not easy. Uh, and nobody seems to be talking about what I think we should be talking about, uh, and that's America's, uh, and your health, my health, America's mental, emotional, and social health. I I'm thrilled to uh, sit down once again with uh, Patrick Kennedy, a former U.S. congressman and uh, the spokesperson for uh, mental health parity, uh, parity along with mental and physical health, uh, recovery, uh, addictions, educating us about substance abuse. Uh, Patrick, you've just, uh, you're our, our, our advocate, you're our leader, you're our champion. Thank you so much. My you've, pleasure. Thanks to be with you. You've done so much. When you look at America nowadays uh, and, and you're thinking about this pandemic, what, what, what are you seeing as far as mental and emotional and social health? What do you see? Well, we already had an epidemic uh, in this country. We were losing 72,000 lives to overdose just two years ago, uh, 48 to suicide. I believe both of those numbers are undercounts. Mm -hmm. Obviously with COVID, we're now seeing over 200,000, but it's shocking to think the attention that COVID has gotten, which is totally Un understood and uh, important to acknowledge the depth of this crisis and it's only through doing that that we actually are motivated to try to stem uh, the tide of those dying from COVID. But in an, in an interesting way, we were losing uh, really almost that much mm -hmm. uh, per year uh, before COVID and we weren't giving it any attention. Occasionally you'd see headlines but when it was reflected in public policy, it was reflected in a way that was a really abysmal. Um, the Congress, uh, the president, just has not done anything to address this epidemic. And uh, I think it really marks our overall historic approach to uh, mental health and addiction. It was one of the reasons why I was honored to be the sponsor of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which very simply said that you could no longer discriminate against these illnesses of the brain when compared to medical and surgical care. And that if we're really gonna make a difference, we have to have the numbers of people to treat. And we don't have those numbers because we don't reimburse for treatment in the same way we would cancer, or diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It was shocking that even though we've known uh, about alcoholism since the 1950s, and we know addiction is a biological and, and genetic, very real genetic disease, um, we've really failed to respond to this as a chronic illness, even mm -hmm. though we know in re reality that its treatment is not much different from every other chronic illness. Our healthcare system still treats it in an episodic way through acute care, which we would never dream of doing if it were cancer. We'd never wait till it was stage four uh, before we would treat um, cancer. And we shouldn't do that when it comes to addiction and mental illness. So what I would say to you, Dennis, is that the challenge of this is not going away. In fact, it's gonna grow exponentially because of COVID. It really affects all families. When you think of the stress and trauma of these crises, and by the way, multiple crises. It's a, a tsunami of stress. And uh, we as a nation had better finally turn the corner and whether we take this seriously and meet it head on, or whether we continue to put our head in the sand. 
Hold it on that note, uh, Patrick, we're going to take a little break. Uh, tell the folks at home, this is America and the world. Underwriting for This is America and the World is made possible by the National Association for Children of Addiction, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. What, what do you think the problem is, uh, Patrick, with people talking about things that they just don't talk about? I mean, what, 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 you know, there is the stigma, uh, and we're doing our best to, uh, you know, reduce that. Uh, but it seems that if people reach out and ask for help, with a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a mental health professional, uh, that, that there's something wrong with that. And you and I both know in a very personal experience that sometimes it's hard to ask for help, but sometimes it's absolutely necessary. What, what, what's going on? Why don't we talk about it? Well, it's interesting, Dennis. Uh, I had the honor of rededicating my uncle's special warfare center at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, called the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center. And when I toured the center, they obviously knew of my advocacy for mental health. And they said to me, Congressman, uh, we have more mental health per Green Beret than any other branch of the service. And I said to the general, I know you know I care about this, but really, Green Berets don't need mental health. They jump out of planes, they swim underwater for miles and don't uh, come up for a breath. They they hit the, the beach and they speak five languages. They take out their target and they're reading to their kids by dinner time. Why do they need mental health? And he said, Congressman, you've got it all wrong. Mental health is for everyone. Uh, we uh, see mental health as a force multiplier is what the general said. In other words, if the military has figured out that in order to reach our maximum potential, we need to take care of our mental health and, and, and that should be our attitudes from the C-suite in America's companies uh, down to those who are suffering really from, as I said, a stress-induced mental health. All of us have predispositions to varying degrees for cancer, diabetes, and for mental illnesses. Uh -huh. However, some people, because of status in life, because of, of political determinants of health, uh, the real impoverishment to so many people, the stress that they live with, have a greater expression of mental health. And frankly, because of historic um, conflation of mental health as a character defect, um, people are not willing to come forward. They see it as their fault, mm. even though I never got up every morning and said, how am I gonna jeopardize my political career because of my drug use of drugs and alcohol? How am I going to alienate everyone around me? How am I going to isolate myself from them? By the way, how am I going to put my career at risk? Um, how am I going to, um, you know, try to get arrested? And I mean, nobody in their right mind spends their days like that. And so to think that this is something that can be equated to some choice um, which is essentially why stigma exists, that people say, well, why are they choosing to do that? They don't choose it at a certain point. Your brain is held hostage um, by the disease of addiction or mental illness. And frankly, we know how to help set people free from being imprisoned in their own minds. We have medications that make a big difference. We have cognitive behavioral therapy, which by the way, is rarely practiced even though it's the evidence form of treatment to help people get into a new life and recover. And uh, we really have a number of other tools, thanks to modern technology, that can help treat it as a chronic illness. Part of the stigma is that because we treat it so late in its uh, pathology, it's hard for people to recover. Uh, if we dealt with it earlier in mm. their trajectory, we would make enormous difference. And frankly, people wouldn't have the stigma around it because they know it's treatable. I'm thinking of mental health, and I'm also thinking of mental illness. Why do people think of it as mental illness and not mental health? 
Well, we have a real crisis of those suffering from very severe mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, eating disorders. Uh, there are a number of diagnoses that really disable people and jeopardize their lives on a daily basis of severe addiction. Um, this runs uh, the spectrum of severity. And part of what our system needs to do is um, really um, risk profile uh, the disease so that we try, try to treat people when they're able to be treated with maximum effectiveness early in the trajectory of their, their illness. And for those who have um, onset of schizophrenia, for example, we, we really delay treatment. People have multiple uh, psycho psychotic uh, incidences before we finally treat them. And then when we treat them, we don't treat them in the way that is most helpful to them. If we treat a people at first incidence of schizophrenia, we could permanently change the trajectory of their lives. They would not have to take the amount of medications that really uh, impinge on their sense of, of quality of life, and which is one of the reasons they go off their medications. Uh, they would not be hindered by the enormous uh, disability that comes from letting their disease pathologize, basically their brain to unravel. Uh, there's no excuse for so many of our fellow Americans to be on the streets because of the fact that they're not getting the treatment they need. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to treat both. There are policies to deal with serious mental illness and there are policies to make sure we promote mental health. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do both things. Um, we cannot do one and not the other. We have to work on prevention just like we have to work on treatment. And finally, we have to work on recovery. That's a piece to this puzzle that we have not done as a nation. We've not built out a system. So when people do make it into treatment and they get on the right path, they stay on the right path. Mm -hmm. And our medical system does not reimburse for that, which is the reason why so many people relapse or get sick again, who really don't need to, uh, but for the fact that our system doesn't meet their needs. What, uh, what do you have? Uh, you have something cooking right now in California that seems to be at the top of your uh, your priority list. Uh, talk a little bit about the importance of what's going on out there that we should keep an eye on. Huh? Well, I started uh, something called the Kennedy Forum, which was on the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy signing the original Community Mental Health Act of 1963, the last bill he signed before he was assassinated. Mm. And it really marked a personal uh, effort on his part to address the fact that his sister, my aunt Rosemary, not only was born with an intellectual disability, but also suffered from a mental illness, which led to the lobotomy that really changed her life and led to her isolation in many cases for a long time before my aunt Eunice really organized families around her a life, which ultimately became the Special Olympics, which is now in 190 mm -hmm. countries around the world. So a remarkable story that my aunt suffering uh, really changed the world uh, more than any other member of my family, ironically. Mm. So what we've been doing in California, like other states, is help those states implement greater accountability and transparency in holding insurance companies accountable uh, to the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, such that people get timely access to care for mental illness and addiction in the same way they would any other chronic illness. This is simply, Dennis, about discrimination. It really is not now about stigma. The stigma exists and people self-shame because of their illness. Systemically, we don't treat these illnesses in the same way. I feel like with the civil rights battles, when we got the Civil Rights Act, we never got rid of racism, but we banished active systemic discrimination the voting rights, fair housing, fair employment, and the like. We need to do the same in banishing this separate and unequal system of mental health, which is seen as something separate from our healthcare system. That can no longer be tolerated. We have to integrate this. So frankly, when we go to the physician for our checkup, we get a checkup from the neck up. In other words, when our kids go to school and they get their scoliosis check and their eyes and their ears, we ought to check them for their ACE score. That's the Adverse Childhood Experience score. Have they grown up in severe poverty? Do they have experience 
of violence. Is one or more of their parents suffering from addiction, alcoholism, mental illness, or is one of their parents in jail? Have they been grown up in a household with uh, these kinds of challenges and stresses? We know to the extent that they have these experiences that it directly affects their future development, which is not unsurprising. It's basically common sense, but it's been tested uh, by the Kaiser Foundation. Mm -hmm. And it's demonstrative that we need to do a much better job at actively intervening with those children early in their life if we don't want the cycle uh, to repeat itself. Uh, if uh, folks have been listening to the conversation very carefully, uh, when you're talking about addiction, alcoholism or drug abuse, um, schizophrenia, and now talking about this early check with youngsters in, in school, uh, there, uh, you have said in different ways as we've proceeded through the conversation that early identification is key uh, to a good mental health, huh? That, that in all three of these situations, it was early identification and then taking some kind of action, huh? So when we go to the doctor, our, the physician asks, what's your history of stroke? Do you have cancer in the family? Things like that. They never ask, do you have alcoholism run in your family? Uh, do you have trauma? Do you have mental illness? Um, in my family, there's no way to divorce the fact that my grandmother died of alcoholism on my mother's side and wasn't found for a week because she was so isolated from my grandfather and from the rest of her family. My mother suffered the same debilitating alcoholism. My father self-medicated with alcohol. He had seen his brothers uh, violently murdered. He'd seen others of his family through tragedy. Uh, that trauma was there. Um, he was under threat of his own life for much of his life. Uh, it's just hard to believe that we wouldn't expect that type of uh, scenario to impact everyone. And it impacted my whole family. And, uh, you know, everybody has to varying degrees those types of stresses, but it depends also on whether you're able to be resilient. And that changes per person. It's, you know, the same stress doesn't always affect everybody equally. But the bottom line is, in order to keep people healthy, we have to focus on the ability to manage stress. If you can't manage stress well, if you have one of these mental illnesses or addictions, you're really compromising the rest of your health. If you, you die 20 years before the average person, um, you have all other kind of health complications. Your health care costs are four times what they would be if you didn't have depression, anxiety, or addiction. I mean, it's, it's shocking that our uh, system of reimbursement does not emphasize the proactive identification, prevention, and treatment of mental health and addiction. You would think that uh, members of uh, Congress up on the Hill and uh, your experience there uh, people who are CEOs of, uh, of major corporations, uh, people in the administration, everybody has somebody in their family who has had a very, very rough go. Why is it so hard? Why did you have to work so hard to get that parity bill passed uh, back in, what, 2008, something like that? So, yes. so that people were looking at mental illness or mental health on parity with physical health. Why is it so hard? Well, frankly, there's a feeling since everyone's affected that treatment doesn't work and people kind of are so frustrated by people who suffer from these illnesses. Let's be honest. If you suffer from one of these illnesses, you're not a very appealing person. It's, it's not as if it engenders much sympathy from family and friends. In, in many respects, people's illnesses uh, burn bridges with everyone that's close to them. So, so they, they push them away. They push them away. They hide them away against uh, their people. Their family members uh, are, are rather um, the most stigmatizing because of the experience of living with someone with one of these illnesses. So it takes a special acceptance that frankly only comes when people understand the biological nature of these illnesses and understand that treatment is possible and have a system where they can access care. Part of the reason people see, feel so frustrated 
is they don't know where to go to get care. They can't access care when it is there. And that care is most likely not of a high quality, so their loved one doesn't get well. And because of the lack of parity enforcement, in many cases, they're forced to pay out of pocket for care that should be automatically reimbursed. You add all those things together, Dennis, you, you set up a system that's going to fail. And that's why it's a self-perpetuating uh, kind of process where people feel the bias against it because they've had all these negative experiences. There are folks who are watching us right now who have someone in the family who is abusing alcohol or drugs or someone who is showing some uh, signs of uh, de depression, anxiety, uh, at a deeper level than is normal, even under the circumstances. What, what, would, what would, based on our own experience, your experience, my experience, people come to me and say, uh, I think my brother-in-law is drinking too much, or I know my dad's got a problem, my mother's got a problem with alcohol. And the first thing I say is Al-Anon, Al-Anon, Al-Anon. <laughs> you know, that's that's, that's my immediate. Uh, Mine too. Uh, Based on my experience, your experience, alcohol, drugs, what would you say to folks? What would you, what would you have them do? What would you, I mean, you're a professional, but you're also a human being. What would, what would you just shift gears and tell them? Well, frankly, I think you're going to see major employers all across this country totally revamp their employee assistance programs to help proactively people meet the needs because they're so aware that when people come back from this COVID crisis, they're gonna be suffering. We know from the Great Depression that suicide was at its peak three years after the Great Depression. The, the ripple effect of COVID and all of the other ensuing challenges is gonna be felt for years to come. Um, businesses do not wanna be losing their employees because of presenteeism. That's when they're at work, but they can't really be at work because their minds are somewhere else. Or absenteeism. It's going to be a huge cost to Americans and, and business. And that's what will ultimately drive change because if they insist for their employees that they get access to good treatment right away, there is going to be less apprehension about getting treatment. And, and treatment, if it's done right, includes the whole family because we know you can't separate a family member and think that the disease is not gonna be fully treated because of the fact that it is a family uh, dysfunction and disease. So I try to just do what I can and that is to take care of my own mental and emotional and spiritual health and to try to be an example that um, there is a great life if you've come through these challenges because you have a much better kind of sensitivity and appreciation mm -hmm. for life and for a spiritual life um, of connectedness. You, you, you are um, now living for others in a way that you never did before because you know your own recovery depends on helping others who are going through the same challenges that you have been through. So. I think that is very attractive to people, but you know, people in recovery are anonymous and they, they go to anonymous meetings and basements of churches and all over the country. And so America doesn't see the other side of these illnesses. If they did, they would admire mm -hmm. the people that they're working right next to them. They're active in recovery, but they don't know about. And, uh, I think that would lighten the kind of negative feelings that people have towards getting help or being part of this amazing journey, uh, which is open to anybody. You know, mm -hmm. if, if someone has a family member, they get the benefit of this. Um, and all of us can use really uh, the 12 steps of recovery in their own lives in a very productive way. I think everybody is going to acknowledge they can't handle these crises alone. They need others. We all need others. We're social animals. Um, I think that people are more isolated than they've ever been in our history. Um, I think that we're going to come to a reckoning in this country that we need to change our culture. Um, this, these crises we're going through now, I, I think are going to move, take things to a head. 
Patrick, we're at the end of our time. I know your wife's running for Congress in New Jersey. You've got kids at home. You're leading the fight. Uh, a thrill to uh, sit and chat with you once again. And thank you for all you're doing for all of us in America. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much, Dennis. Great to be with you. Thank you. A special thanks to the Kennedy Forum. The Kennedy Forum seeks to transform the way mental health and substance abuse disorders are treated in our healthcare system. If you are in crisis or know someone who is, these resources offer immediate help. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, or our YouTube channel, This Is America TV, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Underwriting for This Is America and the World is made possible by the National Association for Children of Addiction, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. <laughs>